Thank you for being here. I hope this finds you in good health, secure. Um, essay on gratitude. This is a letter written to Nietzsche and the uh, the main temple where he was mentored by a great Tendai teacher has recently passed away. And so as an expression of gratitude, he's writing this letter for all of the remaining teachers at Seshoji, the temple where he spent so much time learning. Not by, me, not by any means the only temple, he traveled broadly, but his home base, if you will. And uh, he's writing this letter of gratitude, obviously, to someone who's passed away. So the form of the letter is, I'm expressing great reverence and appreciation for this teacher, but also by extension, the institution that he led, the temple, which means a temple is nothing without its attendant people. So he wants to express his gratitude not only as a thank you, but as an expression of how much his scholarship has expanded and his deep understanding of the history of Buddhism has expanded due to the model of his mentor, right? So he's expressing all of the various discoveries, insights, and he's not going deeply into each one of them, but he's listing them out as important benchmarks in his scholarship, demonstrating not only his stewardship of his mentor's teachings, but his insights as a result of his mentor's teaching. So it's a very comprehensive letter of an expression of gratitude. And that's important to understand. And so we've been reading these paragraphs as we go along that seem uh, to build on the history of Buddhism's development from India to China and so forth. It's back and forth with Japan. And so we arrive now at the chapter or the portion labeled or uh, titled the restoration of the Tendai school by Grandmaster Miao So as we already know, the Tendai school as introduced to Japan uh, went through a series of interpretations, which we can argue historically kind of diminished the Tendai school in its import, not only through its own uh, successive leadership and ego betrayal to, you know, uh, being upheld by the, uh, the ministers of power, whether it's the emperor or the shogunate. And, uh, for the same reason, these other sects rising up because of favoritism and, you know, so on and so forth, not really a Buddhist um, scholarship, but more of a political uh, need, right? So, 
Now we're at the situation where some scholars are rising up and going, hold on a minute. The last few hundred years, this sect has been tarnished by these political egos and it's lost its flavor, if you will, and we need to return it to its fundamentals. So this is one of those restorations by Grandmaster Malo. Nietzsche continues, 200 years after Grandmaster Tendai passed away, Grandmaster Mialo appeared. 200 years. He was a man of wisdom who carefully studied the works of Grandmaster Tendai. Moreover, he recognized, as Tendai had predicted, that the Lotus Sutra was superior to the newly transmitted Revealing the Profound and Secret Sutra and the Hoso School. You gonna be okay there, Chloe? Ah, oh, poor dog. Sorry. Um, so the Lotus Sutra is superior to the, and we read before how the, the, uh, these other sects came in claiming, oh, we just went to India and we found this, as though that makes it new, uh, you know. But it's new to the people of China, so oh wow, new thing to learn. And forgetting all the while the relative superiority of the different categories. It's like everybody's practicing, uh, you know, organic chemistry, which is quite complex. And somebody goes to India and finds out, uh, you know, how, uh, how to read or, or how to uh, write equations of... Uh, combining elements like ferrous oxide under uh, uh, you know the oxygen the oxidation of iron to create rust and they come back and go look at this this is brand new this is this is what we should follow it's like no we've gone well beyond that we're in organic chemistry now no nobody does that everybody just goes okay let's talk about rust <laughs> you know so an oversimplification, but example made. The Qigong school, newly founded in China, and the uh, Great Sun Buddha Sutra and the Shingon school in China. Nobody spoke out, however, perhaps from lack of wisdom, ouch, or out of fear of the people or the emperor, probably more likely, hive mind being what it is, thinking that under such circumstances the teaching of the Grand Master Tendai would disappear and that false doctrine worse than those of the northern and southern masters before Qian in sweet China would become rampant, Grand Master Miao Lo wrote the 30 facile commentary on the three great works of Tendai. The so if you write a great treatise, you don't have to go to India to introduce new information. If you write a great commentary on the teachings you know to be accurate, then your commentary be supersedes in newness. <laughs> it's ridiculous how this has to happen with humans, but whatever is fashionable, right? I mean... The pace of that in our day to day is insane. We don't even perceive it. But think about you know, medieval times to sit down and actually hand write a whole thesis and then have it copied to be distributed. There's no internet. There's no printing press. Yeah. This is a major work. And so when it comes out, it's the newest thing. And by virtue of that, that alone, whether whatever it says, which is really the pathetic part, whatever it says, well, that's the new thing to believe then. Fortunately, in this case, this is a scholar dedicated to making things right, correctly transmitting And Buddhism owes a tremendous debt of gratitude to these great scholars like Nichiren, like Tendai, like Miao Lo, like Dengyo, like Shakyamuni. 
Yeah. So he writes these commentaries, the annotations on the great concentration and insight, which is really just not only regurgitating great concentration in his site, but this is 200 years later. So language has modified a little bit. Terms of explanation have modified a little bit. So he's really not just regurgitating. He's restating for that audience of his day the crux of the great concentration in the insight, which is why he calls it annotations just as I'm doing here. I'm not just reading, I'm annotating, right? Another, the commentary on the profound meaning of the Lotus Sutra. Another Tendai writing the profound meaning of the Lotus Sutra, but he's making a commentary on it so he can restate it while updating for current understanding, language, so on. And lastly, the annotations on the words and phrases of the Lotus Sutra. So those are three Chi'i or Tendai documents which he's reintroducing with a contemporary understanding of his day. In these, he trimmed the redundant and made up for the insufficient in Tendai's original work. So where two, three hundred years earlier, Tendai's great documents of insight may have only needed to state things in a framework to be understood. Two hundred years later, Miao Lo says, well, let me make these things that Tendai say more explicit, more clearly and rounded out for the people of my day, right? He also at once refuted the Hoso, Kigan, and Shigan schools, which escaped Grandmaster Tendai's criticism because they didn't exist yet. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So not only am I going to reintroduce this, which makes it newer, but I'm going to reintroduce it in a way that obviates how these other posers have totally misled you. Brilliant. That's a reformer. People like to call Nietzsche a reformer. In a way, every bodhisattva throughout the history of the lineage of scholarship from Buddhism is a reformer because they are, in fact, not only updating the teachings for the people of their day, which Shakyamuni said would have to happen, But also, by doing so, because the teachings are so concise and succinct in their mission from one sutra to the next, those that have been created outside of that scholarship becomes obvious where they de deviated and where they became self-serving, yeah? So next, he's going to talk about the introduction of Buddhism to Japan. So he's jumping back and forth in history. But remember, this is a letter of gratitude. So he's focusing on each major point of his scholarship and his study under the great, uh, what's his name? Dozen, no, Dozenbo. Anyway, his great teacher at Chejoji. So, on the introduction of Buddhism to Japan, he writes, On the thirteenth day of the tenth month in the thirteenth year, 552, during the reign of the thirtieth emperor, Kimei, this is before the shogunate, right? This is emperor time in Japan. A complete set of Buddhist scriptures and a statue of Shakyamuni Buddha, Buddha uh, were carried to Japan from Pakchi, Korea. Prince Shitoku, son of Emperor Yomei, began to study Buddhism himself and sent Wakeno Imoko, his retainer, to China to bring back a facile of the Lotus Sutra, which he found out because of 
about because of what has been transferred from Korea. So he wants to go back to the source where Korea got it. So he goes to China to find an earlier writing. Which was said to have been his private copy in his previous life. So when he read it, the words of it, the sutra rang true to him from his own life experience. That's what that means, not a previous lifetime, right? Remember always the perspective that birth and death are a momentary ex expression, manifestation of a karmic inertia, which we all are, which everything is. Hmm? During the reign of Emperor Kotoku, the 37th ruler, the Sanran, Kigan, Hoso, Kusha, and Jojitsu schools were introduced to Japan. During the reign of Emperor Shomu, the 45th ruler, the Ritsu school was brought in. So this is over a span of many, many centuries, right? Decades, of course. They were so-called the six schools of Buddhism in Nara. So they, they were all studying all of this scholarship, not necessarily in the correct order, but these were teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha as translated through China. For 120 years, during the 14 reigns from Kotoku to the 50th Emperor Kamu, the two schools of the Tendai and Shingon had not yet been introduced to Japan. You see, these were all earlier teachings and all studied as a group and so different sects became specialized in those particular teachings, all looking for the essential answer, right? So next section, spread of the Dharma by Grandmaster Dengyo, which comes later. During the reign of Emperor Kamu, a young monk named Saicho appeared, later named Dengyo. He was called Great Master Dengyo. He was a disciple of Bishop, or Bishop, he was a dis disciple of a great teacher, Gyohyo of the Yamashinedara Temple of Kofukuji Temple. He studied thoroughly the doctrines of the six schools, such as the Hoso school, yet he did not think that he had mastered Buddhism, seemed incomplete. Reading Kigon, monk, Fat Sang's commentary on the awakening of uh, conviction in the Mahayana, Saicho found Grandmaster Tendai's commentaries quoted in it. And just like I advise you, and uh, as I've done myself, when you see a quotation or a reference in uh, a teaching and you don't know anything about that reference, then it's incumbent upon us to go find out. Because we want our understanding to be complete. Yeah. They attracted his attention. Wondering whether or not they had been transmitted to, Jap uh, to Japan, he asked a certain person who said, quote, Master Chen Chen of the Lung, Lung Shi Su Temple at Yangchao in Dang, China, a scholar descended from Tai, tai uh, ah, descended from Tian Tai, and a disciple of precept master Tao Xian came to Japan toward the end of the Tempo or the Tempo Shoho era. He propagated Hinayana precepts without spreading the teachings of Tendai's commentaries he had brought with him. It was during the reign of the 45th Emperor Shomu. Upon Saicho's request, the man took out the commentaries and showed them to him. Saicho read them only once and was awakened from the illusions of birth and death. Suddenly it became completely clear to Saicho 
that this was the ultimate teaching. It it released, you know, the, to be released from the cycle of birth and death is to be released from the attachment of thingifying, to uh, realize, to self-manifest Buddha, enlightenment, awakening, the structure of every phenomenon in the universe. When that gets clicked open, that gohonzon, if you will, gets opens the Buddha mind, then everything becomes clear, right? So when Saicho read these documents that obviously nobody else bothered to, to uh, propagate, he had his realization. He restudied the six schools of Nara with this enlightenment and found their doctrines were all false false, not that they were lies, but that they were missing the mark, that they weren't fully accomplished teachings. He at once made a vow and accused the six schools, declaring, quote, all the Japanese believe in slanderers of the true Dharma, so the whole land of Japan is bound to be in chaos, end quote, because they're promoting these inferior teachings as the ultimate. And so in doing so, they are violating the actual ultimate teachings of Shakyamuni. This excited all the scholars of the six schools and seven great temples in Nara who arose in bands on the street of Kyoto. Who is this guy saying all of this, calling us out like this? Who the hell is Saicho? The country was thrown into an upheaval. <laughs> Almost some people would say, well, there's a self-fulfilling... Uh, Statement, yeah. Evil-minded monks, in other words, those who would stand on their ego rather than scholarship, of the seven great temples and the six schools of Nara were very powerful. Powerful, why? Because they'd already cemented their relationships with the emperor or the rulers of the ruling elite, let's say. Therefore, on the 19th of the first month in the 21st year of Enraku era, 802, Emperor Kamu personally visited the Takaudera Temple, where he ordered the 14 masters of the seven great temples, Zenji, Shoyu, Hoki, Chonin, King Yoku, Ampuko, Ampuku, Gonzo, Shuen, Jiko, Genyo, Saiko, Dosho, Kyosho, or Kosho, and Kambin, whew, to meet Saicho in debate. All right, let's have it out. All right, Saicho, you've got these, what was it, 13? 14, okay? You're going to take them on. They're all going to batter you with questions and you're going to have to answer. And at the end of it, not only I, Kamu, but because this is a public debate, which cements my, so that I, you know, it's a clever ploy, isn't it? I'm not going to make the decision. I'll make the decision based on the will of the people and therefore cementing his relationship as their big brother, right? He's not just telling us what to do. He's listening to us and he's forwarding our will. What a great emperor. <laughs> anyway, that was just the form of the day, right? So, these masters of Kigan, Sanran, Hoso schools adhered to the doctrine of their respective founders. Saicho made notes on what the masters of the six schools insisted on and refuted them in the light of the canonical sutras and commentaries, as well as various other sutras and their commentaries. So one by one, these masters would stand and make these statements about Buddhism and how their particular school had the essential teachings. And systematically, as they talked, Saicho would take notes and then he would go to his great scholarship and say, well, this sutra says this, Lotus Sutra says this, this sutra says this. All of that completely disassembles your 
arguments. Right? <laughs> so this next sentence starts with dumbfounded. The masters of the six schools could not respond at all. Uh, uh, <laughs> they couldn't. Well, okay. I can't disagree with you because you're right. Those sutras do say that. I know that. Or I can look it up and see that. Is that completely blows all my rhetoric and argument apart. The emperor was surprised at this and he questioned in detail. Well, are you saying that? Because, you know, he's he's been heavily influenced by these other schools. So there's a little bit of saving face going on here, right? He reissued an imperial edict condemning those 14 masters. Okay, it's obvious. All of you are bullshit. <laughs> right? who submitted a written apology to the imperial court, saying, quote, The scholars of the seven great temples and the six schools of Nara have, for the first time, understood the ultimate and complete one-vehicle teaching. <laughs> he doesn't say they're proven wrong. He, so, he shows still that they're great scholars, right? It's an interesting political way to say it. They have, for the first time, understood the ultimate and complete one vehicle teaching, the Lotus Sutra. It has been 200 years since Buddhism began to spread in Japan during the reign of Prince Shitoku. Many sutras and commentaries have been studied, but controversies over the comparative superiority among them have continued without end, because they're competing sects, right? Besides this most wonderful and perfect teaching of the Lotus Sutra was not spread yet, so on and so forth. Now, the long dispute between the Sanran and Hoso schools has dissipated like melting ice. The solution to the dispute has clarified all like the sun, moon, and stars shining brightly with clouds and fog blown away in the sky. Wow. Amazing, yeah? Criticizing the doctrines of the 14 scholars, priest Saicho declared. Or monk Saicho. The scholars of the six schools keep disputing one another with doctrines of, of their respective schools. Both those who inquire and those who lecture are wandering in the fields of Hinayana teachings. Both elders who explain and youths who ask questions think, that they have wiped out the illusions of the six realms of transmigration, but they still adhere to the provisional teachings, which maintain that it will take many kalpa for beings to attain enlightenment without knowing about the perfect teaching of the Lotus Sutra. They have taken meager vehicles of provisional teachings drawn by sheep, bulls, and deer for the great vehicle of the Lotus Sutra drawn by a white ox. How can they realize that as soon as one aspires for Buddhahood, one can attain it? Namu myoho renge kyo. The two brothers, Wake no Hori, Ho, Hirori, my goodness, Hiroyo and Matsuna, two royal subjects, explained, quote, while listening to Monk Saicho, we felt as though we were listening to Grandmaster Nanhue preach the Lotus Sutra expounded by the Buddha on Mount Sacred Eagle, or to Grandmaster Tendai preach his perfect and wonderful enlightenment on Mount Tatsu. Looking back, we feel it quite regretful that the wonderful and profound one vehicle teaching of the Lotus Sutra has been covered with the cloud of provisional teachings and that its triple truth of the perfect teachings has been hidden by them. This is quite a revolutionary event, isn't it? Buddhism is full of those. So Nichiren continues. So did those 14 masters. We, Zengi, and the others are very happy to be able to listen to the wonderful teaching of the Lotus Sutra because of your good karma, or our good karma. In other words, it's our 
fortune and all of this energy which were manifesting moment to moment that we were able to intersect with this teaching. If our residual karma were not ripe, how could we meet this emancipated world? The doctrines of these 14 masters are the same as those of Fa Sang and Shen Xiang of the Qigong school, Chia Xiang and Kanroku of the Sanran school, Tsuen and Dosho of the Hoso school, Duo Suan and Chen Chen, Chen Chen of the Rizzo school in China and Japan. The doctrines are one and the same, just as the just the same as water in different phases. As those 14 masters of Japan, Japanese Buddhism had already given up their false doctrines and submitted themselves to the Lotus Sutra as interpreted by Grandmaster Dengyo, how can any of their disciples claim that such sutras as the Flower Garland Sutra, the Wisdom Sutra, and the Revealing the Profound and Secret Sutra are superior to the Lotus Sutra? So a great revolution is happening here throughout Japan. And all of the schools are submitting themselves to this one great teaching. How wonderful, right? It's not the first time that happened. Let's see how long it lasts, right? The three Hinayana schools of Kusha, Jojitsu, and Ritsu, which had been parts of Nara Buddhism, are not worthy of discussion after the submission of these three Mahayana schools of the Kigan, Hoso, and Sanran. Those who do not know the details, however, believe that the six schools in Nara have never been refuted. So there's a lot of ignorance out there, yeah? A blind man who cannot see the sun and moon does not believe in their existence in the sky, and a deaf man who cannot hear the thunder does not believe in its existence. Moving on. Grandmaster Dengyo and the Shingon School in Japan. So, as you can tell by the earlier statements, some of these schools, the Hinayana schools, phew, finally, just come on, get out of there. You guys don't know what you're doing. But there still persists these other schools. Yeah, we're good on time. Grandmaster Dengyo and the Shingon school. The Shingon school to me is the most violating school, but venerable... Shakarashima, Suba Karashima of the Shingon school, the manipulator, brought the great Sun Buddha Sutra to Japan during the reign of 44th Emperor Gensho. He returned to China without propagating it, however. Gembo and others transmitted a commentary in 14 facels on the great Sun Buddha Sutra. Priest Tokusho of the Todaiji Temple also brought it in. Grandmaster Dengyo read the sutra and its commentary, but he could not be sure of the comparative superiority of the Great Sun Buddha Sutra and the Lotus Sutra. So, in the seventh month of the 23rd year of the Enraku Era, 804, he went to China, where the Tendai meditation and the perfect and sudden Mahayana precepts were transmitted from Master Dao Tsui of the Shi Ming Tzu Temple and Xing Man of the Fo Long Tzu Temple to him. From Master Xu Cao of the uh, Ling Kan Tzu Temple, he also learned mantra, mystic words, or spells, or Shingon in Japanese, before returning to Japan in the sixth month of the 24th year of the Inaraku Era, 805, he had an audience with Emperor Kamu, who at last issued an imperial edict, ordering the students of the six schools of Nara to study and practice the Tendai meditation, Shikan, and mantras in the seven great temples in Nara. Hmm. The comparative superiority of the Tendai and Shingon schools had already been debated many times in China. A commentary on the Great Sun Buddha Sutra by 
Subhakarashima maintains that this sutra equals the Lotus Sutra in doctrine, but the former is superior to the latter in ritualism because of the <laughs> hand symbols and magic words. Grandmaster Dengyo did not recognize the eight, oops, sorry, and that the great Sun, uh, Sun Buddha Sutra is inferior to the Lotus Sutra. It feels like I missed something here. He equals the Lotus Sutra, Nirvana, and former is latter is original. Saying that it was a mistake of Tripitaka Master Subhakarashima and the Great Sun Buddha Sutra is inferior to the Lotus Sutra. Grand Master Dengyo did not recognize the eight schools. Refusing to recognize the Shingon school as an independent one, he recognized only seven schools that insisted that the Shingon belonged to the Lotus School. He regarded the Great Sun Buddha Sutra to be supplementary to the Lotus Tendai School and treated it in the same rank as the Flower Garland Sutra, the Larger Wisdom Sutra, and the Nirvana Sutra. However, perhaps because of the heated dispute over the establishment in Japan of the Tendai Mahayana platform for the specific ceremony for accepting the precepts, he did not teach his disciples clearly about the comparative superiority between the Tendai and Shingon schools. So the Shingon really had its claws set in the populist, you know. Things, mysticals, still fascinate human beings to this day. We have a lot of human beings on this planet who prefer to believe in magical things than what's right before them. There's, I don't know, there's some kind of strange association, I, I don't know what it is, that makes human beings so attracted to shiny things without really perceiving what's going on. It's tragic. It's one of our basic fallacies. And this is what Shakyamuni discovered, that we're so easily attracted to things that it's very hard for us to change our minds and understand the much more amazing fact that all things, as well as you and me thing, are never things. They're just manifestations of potential, constantly occurring moment to moment to moment, that everything's in flux. There is no thing itself. There's just a perception a man of manifestation, a, per a perception of potentials being manifested. And if we can appreciate that, we can see how those things no longer have an emotional hold on our identity because our identity is the greatest fallacy that we are something permanent, that we continue before and after this lifetime. That's nonsense. That's mystical, magical thinking. It's getting in the way of you really experiencing this temporary existence for the magnificent witnessing that it is of this life process. Do you see? You look at the amazing universe or the amazing body Micro, universe, macro, micro, anywhere you look, everything fundamentally is absolutely bewildering and amazing and wonderful. What need is there to make it magical? Just look at what it is. That's, that's beyond comprehension right off the bat. Be amazed by that reality right use your reason your rational thinking and everything seems to be in its place there's no confusion there's no emotion except exhilaration and compassion for those who don't see it look look at how amazing life is don't go la la land on us look at the land is amazing fully amazing without having to go magical. 
no mysticism in Buddhism, not real Buddhism. Go a little further here. So he's taught all these steps. Lost my place, I'm sorry. Sudden my honor pieces were transmitted from Master Tao Tsui of the Shinsu Temple. Also learned he also learned the mantras, the mystic words and spells. I read all that. The comparative. Times of China, refusing to recognize the Shingon school as an independent one. Okay, I think that's where we are. Yeah. Grandmaster Dengyo did not recognize the eight schools. Refusing to recognize the Shingon school as an independent one, he recognized only the seven schools and insisted that the Shingon belonged to the Lotus school. So, like a subtext of the Lotus. It's an error. He regarded the Great Sun Buddha Sutra to be supplementary to the Lotus Tendai school and treated it the same rank as the Flower Garland Larger. So, just an inferior sutra, but informed by some of the same concepts discussed in the Lotus, right? Shouldn't have given it that much credit, but perhaps of the heated debate established in Ta Japan and Tendai uh, Mahayana platform, remember he was trying to establish a precepts platform so that uh, all monks, all students of Buddhism would have to recognize the Mahayana precepts above all other precepts to continue to study and preach the Mahayana uh, uh, Sutras. Uh, in fact, in his lifetime, he did not succeed, but it was done in, this is where he was renamed Dengyo, uh, that, that was established uh, soon after his death. Anyway. Nevertheless, he wrote in his Effects of Tendai on Buddhist Schools, it is certain that the Shingon school stole the true teaching from the Lotus Tendai school and read it into the Great Sun Buddha Sutra. So he did see what happened. Trying to make them equal in doctrine. But this was the manipulation of Subhakarashima, remember? Therefore, the Shingon school is the one that surrendered to the Tendai school. So he was trying to put them in the correct order. But I don't think it was clear enough for the people of his day, not at the moment. The, quote, effects of Tendai on Buddhist schools also quotes a passage in the end of the 10th facile of Grandmaster Miao Lo's annotation on the words and phrases of the Lotus Sutra. According to it, Han Kuan, a disciple of Amogashvara, Vajra, told Great Master Miao Lo that when Tripitaka Master Amogashvara met Bodhisattva Nagabodai on returning to India after the death of Subhakarashima and Vajrabodai, Bodhisattva Nagabodai is said to have respectfully asked Amogash Vajra to transmit to India the commentaries written by Tendai in China. Because there were no commentaries that revealed the true intent of the Buddha and differentiated provisional teaching from the perfect ones. So, <laughs> India wasn't aware. <laughs> it is clear that Grandmaster Dengyo regarded the Great Sun Buddha Sutra inferior to the Lotus Sutra. But you had to study to figure that out. It wasn't an edict. It wasn't publicly distributed, you see. Therefore, it is also clear that Shakyamuni Buddha, Grandmaster Tendai, and Grandmaster Dengyo all regarded the Lotus Sutra to be the most perfect of all the Buddhist Sutras. Bodhisattva Nagarjuna, way back then, who is said to be the founder of the Shingon Buddhism. Not really, but he's said to be. In other words, people take Nagarjuna's scholarship as justification for Shingon. Was of the same view. So he, Nagarjuna knew that Lotus Sutra was superior, right? If we carefully examine his Great Wisdom Discourse, this is obvious, but people who have probably been misled by the treatise on aspiration for enlightenment of Amogavajra, 
<laughs> so again, there's this, over hundreds of years, there's this politic where people will take things out of context and usurp authority for their own gain. So once again, an example of that. The next chapter, my little dog survives, is Grandmaster Kobo's Wrong Doctrine. And before we get into that, I think this video is long enough and we will save that for next time. Thank you, thank you for listening along. If I've, if my reading was too convoluted or skipped around too much, I think that's uh, partly attributable to the writing itself, but I'll take responsibility for any confusion. Let me know, say it in the comments, let me know what's confusing you. Um, I may have skipped over something because I have so many decades of practice and studying this, I may be not drilling down enough or leaving things uncovered. And so I'm as guilty as anyone else of having a lot of assumed knowledge as I read. So if I've made something unclear, please let me know uh, so that I can correct that. Um, it helps all of us. We all need constant insights to keep us focused on the goal, establishing our Buddha mind in every moment of the day. Buddha, 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 just like life, life, life death. Birth death, birth death, birth death, birth death, right? We want to be in Buddha all the time. Not easy. We instantly manifest Buddha as we use our mandala, a great tool of reflection, to center all of our senses on that consciousness. So with this wonderful mandala that Nichiren provided for us, we have the tool of opening that Gohonzon door to our Buddha mind. So we don't have to think about when will I achieve Buddhahood? You do it every time you chant. But does it stick? Or does your attachment of identification immediately cloak it, get in the way, interrupt it? That's our whole practice of Buddhism, isn't it? That's why our conviction has to be very high, right? Our confidence needs to be very high. Here I go, Buddha, Namu Myorengekyo, right? And then we need to maintain it throughout the day. And at night, we remind ourselves. And in the morning, we prepare ourselves and remind ourselves and prepare ourselves. Why? Because every moment we are re-manifested. And that re-manifestation is based on all of the energies that have come to that point. And a lot of those energies have not been Buddha. They've been attachments. So we're trying to shift the balance, right? I know you're doing it. I know you're accomplishing it. This channel is about staying inspired and feeling confident about our Buddha nature. And for that, I have immense gratitude to you guys. And those of my patrons on Patreon or, or simply helping out uh, uh, either regularly or occasionally on uh, paypal.me slash Sifu Sylvain, you make this channel possible. You make the podcast possible. You make the website and the bookstore and the mandala store possible, right? So we all owe you a debt. Thank you. And with all of that said, I will see you in the next one, okay? Bye for now.